Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Nothing like a microphone to quiet people down. Uh, my name is Derek Rommel, and I'm the artist in residence here at the Institute for Advanced Study. And uh, um, we've been doing this series, uh, thanks to Peter Goddard, the director of uh, Writer's Talks and Artist Talks. And uh, today we're, we're very um, honored to have Shimon Atty, the artist from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I first came into contact with uh, Shimon's work when we were residents, we were fellows together at the American Academy in Rome for a year in 2001-2002. And um, his work is, is you know, for, for me it was, it was just really stunning to see his work and I went to several talks that he did in Rome about his work. Um, I've never quite seen anything like it. I, I know that he's been influenced by, by other artists including uh, Anselm Kiefer and various uh, artists, but it really his work, um, it, it doesn't resemble anything else that, I, that I've ever se quite seen. And the emotional resonance is, uh, is, is unusual and, and very profound. Um, he's an LA native, is that right? Yeah, but we'll forget. Right, 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 I'm, I'm, we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, but uh, LA, yes, we've all got our feelings about LA, but um, uh, but interestingly, he he, uh, he began by studying psychology and then uh, got his MFA out there, um, and uh, and then moved to Berlin, where he spent uh, a number of years uh, on the scene there, making different pieces, uh, including the one that was up there, uh, and will be again, I think. Um, He's an artist, I mean, I, I suppose he's best defined as he's a visual artist who, um, who uses a number of different media. He's really a mixed media artist. It's impossible to define. Uh, I asked him before I came up here, how do you define your, your work? Um, I suppose it usually involves photography and uh, a lot of his older work were, were kind of public installations um, and he's worked throughout Europe and, and the States and elsewhere. And... Um, I suppose now the work involves moving images quite a bit, so uh, so that might be the best way to define what he does. Uh, his early works like uh, Writing on the Wall and If Walls Could Talk, which obviously there's a theme going on there, um, Between Dreams and History, these are, uh, maybe, maybe you'll be talking about these works, so I won't say much about them, but, but, but to me they were extremely moving. Um, and so uh, thank you all for, for being here, and I want to welcome the Brooklyn artist, Shimon Atty. Well, Derek, that's the longest I've ever seen you keep a straight face. So, well, th I, I want to th first of all thank Derek actually for inviting me, and thank you to the for the institute for having me as well. Um, you know, it's a little bit tricky because. I've been an artist for a long time, and we have about 45 minutes or 50 minutes, so I have to decide whether to skinny dip, you know, or whether to take two or three and go d deeper with them. Of course, I'm going to show you. I'm going to finish by showing you my most recent project. That uh, you know, most most of us artists are most excited by what we've done most recently because it feels the most current and the most alive. Anyway, so I, I am an artist who my work, you know, it, it lives in between photography, installation art video installation, um, public projects. So let's, let's cut the lights and kill the lights and then, um, because we should have the room as dark as possible if that's okay. Um, and then we'll get the first, slide, the first slide up when we get the lights off. I didn't, I'm sorry, I, I didn't, um, this is good, yeah. This is great. Okay, so what you're looking at, I am gonna come back to the mic. video projector of a, for a still image, so, um, oh, excellent, thank you. Uh, what you're looking at, at is an image from my first project after art school. It is, you're, you're looking at a color photograph of a building in, Ber in East, East Berlin in 1991, and I slide projected on location onto that building what was located there in 1930, which was a Hebrew bookstore. 
Okay, so it's not done with Photoshop. It's not done with photo montage. I do things sometimes the old-fashioned way. And so, you know, if you walked on the street, you'd see me across the street with my generator and my f up to four slide projectors and my camera equipment. And you'd see this projection on the building. So this Hebrew bookstore was located right at that location in 1930. This neighborhood uh, is, in, is in the former eastern part of Berlin, and it was one of the Jewish uh, neighborhoods before the war. So the pro for, for this project, I gathered together street photographs of, of Jewish street life from between about 1920 and 1932. I deliberately did not use any images after the, you know, di directly during National Socialism. Uh, it was, it was, you know, I, I didn't want to use a heavy um, hand in that way. We, we know that what the flow of history was. Um, so, and then I did research on these photographs and, and I had to get the old city maps because East Berlin, after the Second World War, East Germany renamed and renumbered all the streets as a way of kind of, you know, eradicating the history. So I had to get these city maps from 1925, and I would match up these, these, these historical photographs with the lot numbers from the, on the old city maps. Sometimes, if I was lucky, the original building still existed. It survived the Second World War, and it survived the DDR years. Uh, and sometimes it was just an empty lot. It had been bombed out, and in those cases, if I felt that the image was important enough to work with, then I would use a neighboring building of very similar architecture to the original. So the projections typically last one or two evenings, and I'm gonna, you know, we don't have that much time, but of course if we had a lot of time, it would be very interesting to go into, have a discussion with you about how the residents of these buildings responded to seeing the projections of their former denizens and former owners and shopkeepers, uh, uh, you know, uh, basically where they live now. Uh, let's, just, let's just say the, the responses were interesting and varied, but let's move on. A uh, next image. And let's move on to the next image. Slide projection of former Jewish cafe with patrons. They have very clinical names. And, oh, I'm sorry, I should tell you that, you know, in art school, my main medium was photography. So in some works, I actually create installations in order to photograph them. So if you see these on site, you say, oh, it's installation art or public art. If you see them in a museum or gallery, you say, oh, it's photography. For me, those aren't the most interesting issues. Uh, uh, it's more, you know, I, I, I think that I, uh, so ideas can live in more than one form as long as they do so effectively. Okay, next image. Slide projection of former Jewish resident. And next image. They typically one or two evenings for each installation. Um, and that's the Berlin uh, Alexanderplatz. You know, it's probably some of, many of you have been to Berlin probably since I did this project. This was 1990, 1991, 92 early 93, but this neighborhood looks completely different. Now, this is Stadt Mitte, for any of you who know Berlin, which now is, of course, the, the hippest, most trendy, yet gentrified uh, neighborhood in all of Berlin. Uh, back then, and I lived in that neighborhood, it, it was none of that, and it had none of the romance or none of the, it wasn't chic whatsoever. It was, dev it was kind of, I hate to say it, but it was devastating um, to, to live there. Uh, next, next, uh, which I can explain maybe later. Okay, uh, side projection of hat shop, former Jewish owned hat shop with resident. Next image, former Jewish res resident. So there, there was sometimes a ghostly quality. Next image, a former religious book salesman. And of course, just to give you a, uh, just a tangent. In, not, in the early 1990s, you have to remember, the wall came down in late 89. And so it was before East Berlin changed. So you still had the, the original, you know, you had these amazing architectural juxtapositions. You had these, these uh, socialist housing projects from the 1960s on the left side. And then you had these pre-war buildings in complete disrepair because the East German government you know, didn't have the funds to really rebuild like they did in the West. Uh, right next to each other. And so I was obviously trying to create as layered and as complex 
uh, tableaus and installations as possible. My projections were actually just sort of, I was sort of tick tickling the underbelly in a certain sense of, of 20th century German history. Many of the images, they have pre-war history, history of the Second World War, post-war, like sort of socialism years, DDR, and then in some of them there's even post, uh, post Venda, there's like uh, post uh, the wall coming down history. Next image. Next image. Up to three, I, I did up to three, uh, no, sorry, up to four projections on any, at any one time, but usually less was more. This, is, this one had three projections. Next image. Okay, great. So now we're going to move on. So that, like I said, that was my first project out of art school. It was basically guerrilla art. You know, it was very facile, very low tech. It was like, you know, I had, a, I had like a 1964 Ford Granada, you know, four U slide projectors, a, you know, a funky generator, and I was ready to roll. But, so it was very nimble, which I really enjoyed. You know, I didn't, I didn't require huge crews, and, you know, it was, it was great. I'm going to show you in a moment. This will be the first video that you can get ready, uh, uh, but, but don't, don't hit play yet. Uh, it's a video, it's a, what happened was after the Berlin project I started getting invitations to do larger produced pieces, you know, which had budgets and which had uh, long lead times and the public would be invited uh, to them. So one of the, pro I probably have done about, you know, since between 1991 and today, I've probably done 25 major projects. I'm only going to probably show you maybe three tonight. but. Uh, three or four at the most, but let's go on to the video. It, it's a it's a documentation of, of one of my first large. Pro oh no, that's that's video number three, not that one. It's it's on the one on the disc. That would be loaded in there. Yeah, hopefully, it's on your disc desktop as an icon. It's a, it's a, it was an underwater, it was 1995, it was a very large underwater installation. I, it was in Copenhagen and I, I created a piece with nine very large light boxes submerged underwater in one of the central canals of Copenhagen. You could think of a light box as sort of something that kind of backlights an image like what you sort of see at a bus stop, right, an illuminated advertisement. But we had to custom, no, no one had ever put light boxes underwater before, so it had to, we had to have them custom made and designed with marine engineers and whatnot. Is there, it's, it's on the disc. Okay, okay, sure. So, um, um, what was I going to say? The, the piece was called Portraits of Exile, and I was looking at two human rights uh, tales. One was this sort of, the, you know, the, the heroic, Lar yeah, you can let it play now, I guess. This heroic, larger-than-life, mythologized Danish history of the Second World War, um, you know, in, in that they did, there was this epic rescue. They, they did rise up, and they rescued almost their entire Jewish community to Sweden on fishing boats at night over about a seven- to ten-day period in 1943. Uh, 10,000 people were rescued. Uh, but the present day corollary was not and is not so heroic. And that's the issue of refugees and immigrants and the other in Denmark. So, I, so the, the, the theme between these two stories, between the, this historic rescue and the present day uh, response to uh, refugees, uh, the link for, between these two stories for me was water. Water is a medium for rescue, passage, refuge, escape, and of course, memory. So that's why I created an underwater installation. These are detailed shots. They're gonna, it's, the camera's gonna pull back in a second. Um, but there's nine light boxes. Um, some of them are portraits of Danish Jews that were rescued to Sweden. And some of them, like this woman, are present-day refugees who live in Denmark but under very restricted circumstances, like with very uh, short-term residence permits. She was, she's from Pakistan. And it was always a, a portrait in the foreground and then a background sandwiched image to give some context from the former Yugoslavia, and that's a Danish entry stamp on her passport, limited, limiting her, her uh, 
residence stay in Denmark. So you're hearing, you know, I'm the artist and I'm sort of, I'm kind of giving you the, you know, I'm kind of giving you the content, but that's not really how it works when you're on site. You know, when you're on site, you see, you know, the first thing that happens is you have this really uh, uh, visually arresting and dramatic visceral experience, these nine huge faces glowing underwater that are kind of coming up almost like for air. I didn't tell you, the light boxes are very large. They're about two meters by two meters by about a meter deep. They each weighed a thousand pounds. And if we had a lot more time, I wouldn't, we could talk. What was epic was the installation, you know, with cranes and frogmen and all of that. But, but the design was very, very challenging. Because we, they had to be designed so that they would flotate and not fall to the bottom. But they had to be reinforced with steel so that every time a boat goes by in the canal, the, the, if, if, if the box kind of torques a little bit, the, the bulbs inside would break. So they had to be reinforced. It was very challenging. This is an image here of a Danish Jew rescued to Sweden. Together in the background is one of the fishing boats used in the rescue. This installation was on view for about six weeks. It was sort of the, the official, um, it was sort of like the official artwork for the city of Copenhagen on the anniversary of, the 50 year anniversary since the end of the Second World War uh, in Denmark. You know, that's an eel, I think. And, and you know, there was obviously interaction with um, sea life. They're about, um, you can fast forward it a little bit there, I think. They are about, you know, they're about 15 feet from the edge of the canal, from the bank. I think there's an image. Oh, there. Let, you can let it play from there. That's what they would look like in the daytime. And I think here in this, cl in this clip, there should be, the, you might see the side of the bank right after here, right after this image. Yeah, so this is just sort of the edge right here. And here you see all nine light boxes. And there are usually hundreds and hundreds of people there because the Danish parliament building is just right set back. Um, so we should get the cursor off of the, Paul? Yeah, excellent, thank you. Oh, it comes back, yeah, I know, I know. It's like, a, excellent. So. Then, um, now I have to make a tough choice. Okay, let's just for a moment go back to the PowerPoint. And you can go ahead and whenever it's ready, you can, you know, this just we're not going to use anymore. I'm just going to briefly, because, because Derek said if buildings could speak. So, I'm going to just briefly show you a couple of images in passing uh, from my first major project in the US. Uh, I moved back, I lived in Berlin for about six years until 96, end of 96. And I moved back then and did a large project in Manhattan that opened to the public in 98. And it was, with, it was in the Lower East Side which many of you probably know is America's, has been America's gateway for new immigrants for the last 200 years. You know, it's a place of the port of call. Um, and, you know, first landing for almost every immigrant group. And I created a large laser installation where the handwritten memories, here you go, where the handwritten memories of residents of the neighborhood were written out in blue laser light onto the buildings of the neighborhood. Unfortunately, these are just some still images. It's really better to see this in moving image because it, it's not just projected bang. Actually, they're written out letter by letter as if a ghost is writing. I mean, I do, I actually do have that DVD here, but it's, I think we don't have time to do that. But I, I interviewed 75 residents of the neighborhood and asked them to write down in their first language uh, to, to respond to different questions. Like one of them was like, um, what was your first memory of, what's your first memory of the Lower East Side? Um, or can you remember your favorite nursery rhyme from childhood? And so I had hundreds and hundreds of pages of responses, predominantly in four languages, 
uh, Chinese, Mandarin, Spanish, English, and Yiddish. And I, from hundreds of pages, I edited together 28 of them to kind of create a se seamless poetry in multiple languages. And one of the recurrent themes was sort of um, displacement and longing for home. Next image. Yeah, these are. This was a Chinese poem, but it's trans. This, that's. They were written both in the. They were written out by lasers, both in the original language and then also translated to English, um, as well. Next image. This is someone's handwritten. This is someone's memory about this particular building, which I found really interesting because it was, it was a very site-specific memory. Next image. That might be the last one of those. Okay, great. So. You know, I, I've shown you like maybe three or four projects, and in the in the that piece was in 1998. Uh, you know, maybe maybe I'll show a couple of the Rome ones, just be, partly partly because I want Derek to see them because I I was with Derek in Rome for a year, and uh, he no one ever really got to see what I did in Rome because I, it was really I got really very serious at the very end, the very last three months, and I didn't show it, but it later got you know it was a book and a traveling exhibition. Uh, it was called The History of Another, this project. It was with, also with on-location slide projection made in order to be photographed. They weren't public installations. They were all about the photographs. And I was, next image, and I was using present day and ancient Rome as kind of a backdrop or a foil for the grand history of the West. And onto and into these sites, I was projecting images of images of people sort of, let's say, of unknown and ambiguous origin to the viewer. They were Roman Jews photographed uh, between about 1880 and 1920, but I was also, to be honest, I was also, um, you know, I was thinking about things like sort of the, the other in more, in more, uh, in broad terms. Um, and I was trying to, ne next image, trying to raise questions about who's, in, who's on the inside of this grand history of the West and who's on the outside. And so, this is called Looking Onto Temple of Apollo. And sometimes we look over their shoulder and sometimes they look back at us and implicate us in this kind of triangulated relationship. Next image, the perennial man under the bridge image. This is simply called Under Castle Saint Angelo. Next image. Uh, uh, at, at Temple of Fortuna. Um, the, most of these sites are archaeological sites and required special permission, which, well, it's, it was it all just say it's Italy, so. <laughs> okay. I'm still standing, but, uh, you know, and I was also kind of interested in the Roman, you know, how Rome aestheticizes its historical sites with this very garish lighting. You know, it's, it's sort of like the Miami Beach or South Beach approach to like, you know, uh, pre present historic pre uh, presentation of sites. It, so at some point I kind of realized you have to let Rome be Rome. So next image, at Temple of the Fornicata. Okay, Paul, I think that's enough from the Rome series. Now I'm going to fast forward um, and I'm going to get a little more recent with you. Um, I, the last five years or so, you know, we as artists, we don't, you know, we, we, it's always this, you want to grow, you want to develop, you want to change to some extent, uh, you want to stay alive, right, so with your forms, and I've become very, very interested in the moving image, and, and uh, basically I create, mostly in the last few years, I create multiple channel video installations, immersive multiple channel video installations. It's like when you go into a museum or a gallery, you walk in, you're not just staring at a wall, you're surrounded by several walls of projection. You're in a, kind of in a video, in an immersive video environment. So the, mediums, the medium has changed a bit, but not necessarily the, the, my sensibility or, or my, my sort of, um, you know, my subject matter. I'm still very, very, much interested in, in human memory. Um, so which one should I do? Um, uh, uh, yes, thank you. Number two. Paul, that's perfect. So the one thing I'll tell you about my video piece is I, I, I rarely use special effects. 
because you might look at these and say, oh, it's digi done digitally. And it's, you know, the, the, my video works are heavily influenced by my original training in photography. So that I, they kind of lie at the junction between the still image and the moving image. But I, you know, many people, they'll animate still photographs, they'll use After Effects, and they'll give this impression of moving. I, like I said, I do, every, well, I do everything the hardest way possible. So the, peop, the performers in my videos are actually standing there holding static poses. On, and they're standing on an unseen moving stage that we design, custom design and build for each project. So let us, I could show the whales piece or I could show the racetrack piece. Derek, do you know my racetrack piece? Just on the stuff that's not mine. Oh, well you, okay, well let's, let's do the, let, you know, the racetrack piece is, is, not, is a little more uplifting, I suppose. So uh, Derek actually did the soundtrack for my, for my whales piece. Uh, but, um, oh, perfect, okay, so just, so just hold it there for one second, excellent. So this is, this is a piece from about 2007, 2008. I was approached by, you know, sometimes these things just fall out of the sky, right? I was approached by somebody who said, may I invite you and commission you to make an artwork based on a former automobile racetrack? And, you know, I, as often is the case, because I know, how, I know what a big commitment it is to do a project, right? It's a year or two of your life. You know, and we have we, we don't have an unlimited amount of those. So I said to him, uh, you know, uh, I don't care about racing as a sport, and I certainly don't care about race cars, which are the you know that's, that's like the two you know those are the two sins right from the, the, the racing community is very can be very intense. Um, I said, but if you let me reinterpret according to my own artistic sensibility, how me human memory inflects notions of speed, loss, transit, uh, spatial displacement, we might have something to talk about. And the reason, we, the, the race track doesn't exist anymore. It was closed in 1994. But there's this whole community of people whose lives intersected there. And it's, it was the former track in Bridgehampton, Long Island. So I created a piece called Racing Clocks Run Slow archaeology of a racetrack. I'm not going to show you the whole, the video, the, all of it. I'm just going to, this, this just has a few excerpts on it. The piece is base, is, is basely, that was good, that was really, really good. Loosely based. Did you hear what I just said? Basic. What is that? Is that like in, like, interference? Is that, what do neurologists call that? There's a term for that. Anyway, uh, loosely based on the law of physics by which time slows down the closer you get to the speed of light. So in the piece, things speed up in order to stretch and slow, stretch out and slow down. I invited, I'm gonna stop in a minute, but I invited 70 people in my studio, into the studio whose lives intersected at the former track. There's no actors. I asked them to perform in the, in, 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 in the to perform their role at the track in the form of a simple physical gesture that distilled it, that, that they and I came up with. And, you know, so race car drivers, I invited in paparazzi, you know, the track uh, announcer, uh, pit crew people, spectators, you know, you name it. And uh, the things that look like props are not props. They are real, authentic ruins from the track. Many of them we had unburied, do you say, uh, dug up. We had many of them dug up from the grounds, like you know, you know, you'll see like flag boots and 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 railings. So and and part uh, part of the sound the part of the soundtrack is based on actual recordings that were made there that I then transformed. There we go. Now we can start it. So it's just going to be some excerpts. And the audio and the real pieces, you know, you you have to remember that. Uh, you're getting a very reduced experience. This is like, this is not the installation. This is like a viewing copy slash documentation. So in fact, it's about 50 feet. It's a 50 feet long, kind of almost like a dioramic kind of environment. It's three screens that are beveled. In high definition, each of them eight and a half feet tall. You're getting everything squeezed down and this is standard def. And it was surround sound, 12 speakers. It's, it's permanently installed out there at the side of the former track.
each of them are projected life size, and so you have to use your imaginations. And she's the she was the first female race car driver in the U.S. certain tropes from cinema about racing. There's always the nervous girlfriend at a distance watching the race on television. That earlier scene, the women from the apple, with the apples, that was very similar to a scene I saw in, I think, Le Mans or Grand Prix, the film. Um, there's certain tropes that I was playing on. The volume could be up a little bit. You could turn it a little louder. Up. Good. Speeding up to slow down and stretch out. Okay, I think that's probably enough of that piece. Um, and now we get to go to my favorite part, <laughs> which is to tell you what I just completed. Uh, that, was, that one was about three years ago. That was a huge production, oh my goodness. Um, our studio was like the size of, an, of a, almost like an airplane hangar. It was, it was enormous, and these moving stages, it was just, it was insane. But um, my most recent project uh, just opened at the Aldridge Museum about two weeks ago. It's called Metro Palace, and I, I, um, as opposed to Metropolis, like, which is like the most overused title for you know, everything these days. But I was very, um, let's just say, I first want to back up and say I, I have a, a, a kind of a, in, a strong personal connection to the Middle East, both in terms of where my family comes from and also I lived uh, there for parts of my youth. And, and the, the, uh, the conflict uh, between Israelis and Palestinians is... You know, it's, it's something that I profoundly, I mean, I care very much about, as many of us do. And I, um, but I never dared approach the subject matter because it's so over-mediated. And many, and the traps are, you know, so numerous to, I mean, to mention. I mean, it's just, you know, whatever you do, you know, you're in the crosshairs no matter what. It's like get, being in a, in a circular firing squad, being right in the middle, right? But I... I, I started this piece by, stu I was studying the Declaration of Independence, the Israeli Declaration of Independence from 1948 that David Ben-Gurion read. And then I studied Mahmoud Darwish's Palestinian Declaration of Independence from 1988. And I was, sh I want to say shocked, I was startled by how similar key sections of the documents are. Not every, there, there's differences. I mean, first of all, the Palestinian, it's written by a poet, okay? So it's twice as long, um, okay? And there are sections of it that are very specific to the Palestinian issue, like things like, um, we, honor, we honor the bravery of fallen Palestinian women. You know, things like that that have a specificity to them. But the, but the, but the, the main thrust the heart and soul of the two documents in terms of kind of the discourse of self and the rhetoric of self-determination, it was st it, the, the, the similarity is staggering. Sometimes it's entire paragraphs, sometimes it's entire sentences. So I was, I was um, you know, I, I, I couldn't get my finger off the point somehow. So I, I spent months studying these, these, these two declarations and I created a hybrid document that blends elements of the Israeli Declaration of Independence and the Palestinian Declaration. Now, I do want to say that there were other important differences between them, um, and I left some of them in, and they, they, they often had to do with Palestinian resistance 
to being occupied. And I, I did leave those in, some of those in the final um, document that I created because I'm certainly not trying to reduce or simplify a very complex uh, uh, landscape, you know, political and social landscape. So I created this document, and I then what I did, and okay, about a quarter of the words are from the Israeli declaration, a quarter of the words are from the Palestinian, and about half of the words are identical in both. So I, I, but the other part of it, though, was I live in New York. We're not in the Middle East. There's hundreds of thousands of Israelis and Palestinians. I don't know if there's hundreds of thousands of Palestinians. There's hundreds of thousands of Israelis, and there's many tens of thousands of Palestinians that live in New York. So I, was, so I created a piece that's also about New York as much as it's about the Middle East, this sort of triangulation of Israel, New York, Palestine and whether this shared secondary hybrid identity, that of being a New Yorker, creates perhaps or perhaps not some interesting oxygen in the, narrative, in the space between the narratives of these two communities. So I mention that now because now what I did is I, I filmed 24 New Yorkers, 12 of them are Palestinian New Yorkers, 12 of them are, are Israeli New Yorkers, they, and I, when I say unfortunately, I do mean this. I mean unfortunately. They had to be professional actors because what I asked them to do was very complex. And for it to create effective work of art, to draw the viewer in, they had to do it well. And I tried with lay people at first, and it, 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 was, it was impossible. So um, I created, <clears throat> so there's 24 performers. It's an eight channel installation in the round, about the size of this room. And <clears throat> eight channels in the round. And they, <clears throat> they're performing the document in a, almost a, like a poetic slash almost Shakespearean register. Israelis never say Palestinian words. Palestinians never say Israeli words. They say their own words or they, and they say shared words. But again, half the words are shared. So why don't we start it? This is just, again, a, it's a little viewing copy. I'm just going to show you a, a, maybe like chapter one and chapter four. Um, <clears throat> I'm probably forgetting to say stuff, but that's OK. Oh, there's, it's overlaid with 12 New York types. That's what, that's what this is the point. There's 24 people, 12 pairs, two Williamsburg hipsters, one Israeli hipster, one Palestinian hipster, two MTA employees, one Israeli, one Palestinian, two I Love New York tourists, one Israeli. This is just a, this is just a diagram showing you uh, the set of, and they're raised high. So you in the view, you're in the middle and you're looking up. It's a bit like witnessing a conversation in the Roman Senate because you're kind of in the bit, the, you're a bit lower. You're, you're sort of witnessing and it also goes through you, but there is, they are a little, I am, tr I was trying to actually take it a little bit out of the, out of the reel a little bit. Now before the piece starts, but again, it's an eight channel. You thought it was hard to see the two, three channel to get an understand for the racetrack piece. This is eight channel. It's a couple of samples of just um, one channel first by itself. The piece hasn't started, but this just shows you the production values a little. Jersey Shore Palestinian. <laughs> That's her role. And they desaturate when they go back to, they alternate between being animate and inanimate. And we, we develop this kind of waxy, desaturated patina. Okay. And then they come to life and saturate. Keeping of their rights to be masters of their fate in their own. New York, Israeli, urban street youth. You know, like with the pants falling down, etc. <laughs> Palestinian MTA employee. The right of the people to the rebirth of their nation. And now the piece starts, the A channel. Um, they had to either, 
I mean, even though they're actors, all of the Palestinians are Palestinians and the Israelis are Israelis. So it's their true identity. Sorry. Um, they have to be able to do either a Hebrew accent. Oh, sorry, one second. Have to be, you have to imagine being surrounded by these people and they're life size. They're very large HD plasma screens. Okay, let's, I, I, I just want to finish by showing the end of the piece. Let's fast forward a bit. If, if you can bring up, I don't have the cursor. Uh, yeah, go to about, um, is it 11 minutes and three seconds? Go to about 11 minutes. If we can back up just a little bit. And, and there's four chapters where it, it goes real briefly to black between each chapter. And when the new chapter comes up, there's different characters. Um, because that, that was just four pairs. But as I said, there's 12 mm -hmm. pairs in the piece. So I'm just going to play you the last chapter to the end. That's the end of chapter three. Two falafel cooks on the left. <laughs> and they're, they're not in pairs in the last chapter. Whereas the people reaffirm most definitively the right of the people of their rights. Now, whereas on the 29th of November, 1947, the United, United Nations, Nations passed, passed a, resolution a resolution recognizing our right to self-determination calling for the establishment of our state which partition the land into two states. And whereas the General, General Assembly required the inhabitants of the land in, in pursuance of the, the resolution, resolutions, this figure to take the necessary steps. Accordingly, we Accordingly, we. Accordingly, we. 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 Members, members of the, of the People's Council. In the name of God. And in the name of, of the people. By, by virtue, by virtue of, of our, our national, legal, and, and historic rights. rights. Hereby, 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 proclaim, proclaim declare, declare, declare the establishment of the state 
we affix our, our signatures, signatures to this proclamation, this proclamation occupation on the soil, on on the the soil, soil of the homeland of, of, of the homeland. And so you have to sort of, <laughs> you have to take the, thank you. <clears throat> we could get the lights on now. <clears throat> and uh, I, I say so you have to take the intensity of that and multiply it by about 50, right? To, don't you think Thomas? Because <laughs> Thomas actually saw the real piece. Um, it's, it's so reduced to see it like this, but at least you, you get a, at least a, 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 a teaser for it. Um, but it's, <clears throat> you know, it, it's a very technically complex project to produce. The, the performers are, they, there's two unseen teleprompters in the studio, plus they have a invisible earpiece in their ear to keep everybody on time. They're all listening to and performing to the same master recording, uh, master performance. And they practiced for about three weeks in advance at home. Um, so it's a, it, it's a very, you know, it's just a complex, you know, it's, 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 it's the thought with, with, you know, making things look simple. Um, so, a little Q&A. As you wish. Yes. So in the Berlin piece, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was about to <clears throat> get into that level of detail, and I decided not to. Yeah, indeed, as as we know, like a, you know, photographs don't have those shapes, right? So I, <clears throat> and this is before the days of Photoshop and all that. I, and I, you know, I, the answer is yes, and it took hours. I would be on location. I'd put in a slide. I'd pull it out. I'd put on like either Kodak opaque slide paint, right? I assume they still make it, but I don't even know. Uh, put, put it back in. Oh, no, 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 I don't like that. I'd pull it out, wipe it off, do it again. So, so if they had rough edges, I was trying to get a sense of like the kind of this portal, like burning through, a, like, a, like sort of a portal almost into the, you know, into, into t today, the past burning through uh, the facade in order to come today. If they were straight edges, sometimes I would do, I would follow the architecture like in a more precise kind of, architectural way, then I would use a, like Kodak slide tape, you know, with an X-Acto knife and, but that's, that's, you know, that was part of the artistry of it because if you don't, if the image doesn't blend with the architecture, it looks like a 2D paste on, which is simply not very interesting, period. So that was part of the labor of love was to do all that, yeah. Yes. Which ones? From the Berlin Project? Um, <clears throat> well, before I even started that project, I mean, before I started the first projection, I, it, was a, it was about 10 weeks, I think, of heavy-duty research in archives in Berlin. Probably about half of them were like, like governmental archives, like Sid, like like Stabi, or I don't remember the specific ones I went to, the Staatsbibliothek, like the either federal government or municipal libraries that had photo archives in them. And then uh, a large number were from private collections of family collections that I had access to. Um, either individual families or there was also one particular gentleman who had spent a good, a, a large amount of time assembling his own collection uh, that he gave me access to to use, uh, and then there were, and then this, there was a small number for that were from press archives, German press archives. Um, so I think that kind of covers co covers it. Where, yeah, yes. Most of your projects are involved twenty four issues, but broadly defined. So 
deliberately sometimes some of the pretty harsh reactions to things like this one and this one here, like in the, in the Copenhagen piece or mm-hmm. Right. It's interesting because I, I smiled when you said that because I was just remembering a, a, a meeting that I had with a curator recently who, 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 <laughs> who said that my work wasn't sufficiently political for her taste. <laughs> so, but this is sort of the agonies and ecstasies of being an artist, right, or being in the public eye, you know. Um, so uh, I, I am going to address your question. I'm just sort of, I'm, I'm kind of easing gently into it because it's an important question. But... Um, uh, but just on that note, though, which is to say that you know there are many artists who work with political subject matter uh, in ways that are perhaps m- a little more. Uh, now, this last project aside, let's let's leave, because this is the most political project I've done in a very long time. Okay, but you know I I like to create experiences that are complex and and e- emotive and difficult to interpret. So for me, the visual language is important. I like to go for the 50-yard line between form and content. And it's a very hard line to straddle. So, which is not the question you asked me, but I'm, a- I'm, 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 a- I'm answering it first to just say what my intention is. Because if it's pure politics, then I'm, I don't feel like I'm an artist. And also, if there's no, if, if there's no, uh, if there's not oxygen left for individual interpretation, then for me, a work becomes too simple in general. So the, this last one is very, very political. So you asked if I sometimes get in trouble. Is that what you asked? Well, I imagine that well, in many ways, your work wants to raise questions or make people think right. about complex issues. So sometimes uh, these questions which are raised are not on the face of stuff. And sometimes I, I assume that right. Right. And I would assume that it's part of your function of your piece to stir things a bit. Yeah, that's where things get a little tricky. The, the last part, because I wouldn't be the, I wouldn't be the, I would never make that claim, uh, uh, because again, that uh, uh, that uh, that's more for the critic to 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 say. I mean, in terms of, because I, I don't, I actually don't do things in a kind of a propagandistic sort of way. Stirring things doesn't mean propagandistic. Right. That is in itself uh, questioning the status quo. Of course, of course, of course. But let me get to. But let me. No, no. That's the yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But I, but I want to try to actually answer your question because the the answer is um, you know because there's also different you know are we talking about critical uh, critical res- like art response or critical from the public at large and the culture at large? Um, it's been everything. So, for example, in the Berlin project. It was everything from, I got physically assaulted more than once and threatened uh, to, and sometimes I had to have <laughs> little quasi bodyguards with me, to people being very, very supportive, especially the younger generation, uh, and, and just staying with me night, night after night after night just to hang out while I was doing it. There, there was a very full range. And, um, uh, It's a really like a project by project thing. The Copenhagen project, you know, the, the Danes were so like, um, you know, some people just like to say no. Like the Danes found every possible way of saying yes. Can you imagine getting like the New York City Port Authority, the Harbor Authority, to devote boat traffic for two months for an artist? To, it's just it's a crazy, and they did that. So no, and so it's kind of a, a case by a project by project thing. Um, uh, this one, uh, it just opened, and I, I, I <laughs> yes, there may be some, I, 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 <laughs> I'm laughing because, I, you know, I, I, I've already, I was already accused, even, you know, let's see, one person said that, I, and this was not a Palestinian, actually, it was not, it was like a very left-wing Israeli, but I was accused of supporting the occupation, <laughs> just by wanting to do such a project, <laughs> which I thought was a little bit cuckoo. Um, uh, and then 
some Israelis, uh, you know, because you might infer like, you know, maybe the project is, is the project maybe is inf inferring moral equivalency or something like this. And I don't, I don't really think in the, I'm not, I don't, I don't think like that. I, 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 for me, it's more like the insanity of this endless hall of mirrors of similar, of similar uh, 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 claims and assertions and needs um, that, uh, I mean, there's something just startling about that for me. So, uh, So I, I, I expect that this most recent project is probably one that will be perhaps the most relevant to your question that I've had in quite some time, actually. But it just opened, so I don't, I don't know yet. Yes? Last one, yes. And the first one about Berlin was again um, a memory mm -hmm. of the Jeweler, but you were controlling it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the exile was much more you know, open ended or. Yeah, right. uh -huh. so I do, I do. You know, it's 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 um, I I I I I do somewhat, but I don't I don't know if I think about it quite in those terms. But I do think about the issue of content and subject matter, and excuse me, quite a bit. And it's interesting because it, it, it's sort of related to your both both of your questions. Because there are many artists who are very, uh, you know, much more hardcore political in their work than I am, and much more literal. I have this nasty habit that I can't shake, which is that I want things to also look beautiful. And I'm sorry. Well, no, but I, I like, I like the, you know, I believe in the power of visual seduction to create a soft landing for, for dealing with the content. And so, uh, so I think some people would consider me not, really not nearly political enough. You know, memory, I mean, the, the, the line between memory and sentimentality and nostalgia is a very slippery slope. And this is something that I try to be very, very mindful of. There are so many traps, and I, I uh, that one can fall into, and uh, I do vary a bit. I do vary a bit. Some, sometimes I do, I do because I'm, I'm so. Uh, my temperament. I, I mean, I'm a person for whom memory is very important personally. So. Uh, I'm so interested in human memory that sometimes that's the main, almost the main thing, and memory is inseparable from loss, um, sometimes traumatic loss. And, you know, there's some projects I, sh I did that were very difficult that I didn't show, um, but uh, in, in this regard. Uh, but, but, uh, and, but the recent one is a bit more, it is, you know, it, it, it's, well, first of all, it's, ba it's textual. It's based on language, and it's very, you know, it is more, you know, so it's a little bit of an experiment. Um, so, what else? Yes. So what are you going to do next? Okay. Well, I am, first of all, I'm creating some 2D, I'm, I'm creating some 2D and 3D works that are based on the, related to the video. I'm having that, sections of that hybrid text that I created sandblasted into marble, and I just had a letterpress version of it uh, created, and now I am also doing the two declarations in Braille on black paper, side by side as kind of diptychs, 
Uh, but what I'm, but 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 in terms of video, what I'm doing next, and it's a very very early stages. Okay, I haven't nowhere near production. I haven't started. You know, I'm just thinking. But to me, uh, now that the door has been open to work with text and the spoken word, because this is the first time the subjects in my video have come to life. Um, I'm wrapping this up, Derek. Um, yeah, you. I mean, coffee or. No, um, so um, uh, this we, we have a we, we rib each other from from our days in Rome. We just goes back and forth. Sorry, but um, uh, what I was this is the first time my my performers come to life. That they're usually they stay they stay inanimate. In this piece, they come to life and they go back to being inanimate again. So my new piece, it's going to deal. It's a very early stages. It will it will be textual. It will be text based. I, it's going to deal with what I consider to be the three. Comp the three central competing ideo worldwide ideologies of our time. Um, international global capitalism, local nationalism, at its worst one could say tribalism, but let's just call it nationalism, and religious fundamentalism. So it's going to be some kind of triangular, I, I don't quite know, it's, it's way early, but it's going to be a project that takes some of these new beginnings here and some of these new, new strategies, but, a, but, but, but more on kind of a, a, a different ideological plane somehow. Well, thank you very much. I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm always amazed at how many things, his, how many different areas uh, Shimon's work uh, takes into account, not only in the, within the arts, like uh, visual art and you know, film and um, uh, photography, uh, but also kind of theater, dance, all, 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 these, all these kinds of works. I mean, the, the piece that we worked on had holograms projected that were moving and I mean it's but also technology I mean aside from the whole political aspect I mean just this just the kind of work that you have to do to create uh, to create um, art like this uh, I mean the, the amount of kind of back work that you have to do to figure out once you have the idea how to actually realize that and make that happen I mean I just, it, I just it, I'm always quite astonished by it. So thanks for sharing your work with, with us. And I wanted to just you know mention that there is a concert. I'm not sure if there are still tickets. I think there are uh, for the March uh, concerts, which uh, so uh, get them while they're hot. Uh, and thanks. We're going to have one, one more talk uh, by an artist uh, writer who's coming in in April. So looking forward to that. Thank you, Shimon. Thank you, everybody.